All right, welcome into our February GBMC Facebook Live. This is where we get to talk to the experts really about topics that affect all of us. So today we are talking to Dr. Fung Lu, Assistant Professor at Johns Hopkins and in the Department of GYN Oncology at GBMC. And today we're talking about cervical cancer, HPV vaccinations, and really everything in between. We're so lucky that we get to talk to these doctors each month because this is your chance to ask any of your questions. We want this to be interactive. So we're hoping that people will jump on Facebook Live, send this link to your friends. If you know this might be a topic they're interested in, and this is the time where you can ask your questions. I'll ask Dr. Lou for you, and we'll get those questions answered. So we're going to get some people on our Facebook page now joining in. Hello to everyone and hello to Dr. Fong Lu. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So this is a really important topic. It's a topic that, I mean, cervical cancer, of course, affecting women, but HPV is something that affects men and women. Um, so talk about just cervical cancer first. How many people is it affecting right now? I mean, I, it's, it's really common, isn't it? So cervical cancer, thankfully, is not that common because of great screening and great preventative measures that we have in this country. Um, but what causes cervical cancer is HPV, and HPV is extremely common um, for any sexually active adult. Um, it's really a ubiquitous thing, and the important thing that I like to counsel patients about and make sure that the public understands is that they go in for their routine screening, um, so, pap smears and HPV testing. Okay. So cervical cancer, not so much as common as you said, but HPV, yes. very, very common. I have yes. heard some statistics thrown out with HPV and it seems like, I mean, almost, would you say most of the general population? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the thing about HPV that I think sometimes is difficult to understand is that, you know, there are, there are over 200 different subtypes of HPV and the vaccines that we have protect us against nine of the most common strains of HPV that go on to cause the majority of things like genital warts and also cause, um, most of the cases of cervical cancer. Um, and so, yes, it is very common, but um, it can lead to some very, very serious consequences if you're not seeing your doctor regularly. Gotcha. With the HPV um, vaccine, mm -hmm. are you starting to see that more people are coming around to it at even a younger age? Has that been sort of controversial how early we wanna get people vaccinated? Yeah, it, um, you know, the recommendation from the CDC is that um, both boys and girls um, starting at the age of nine can get vaccinated. It's recommended um, that uh, boys and girls at 11 and 12 get vaccinated as kind of the ideal age. Um, but the vaccine has really been around since 2006. And um, those of us who treat um, cancers caused by HPV, like cervical cancer, like vaginal cancer, like vulvar cancers, we really um, would love to see more of an uptake of this vaccine. Um, and uh, we wish it was as higher than, than it was. And yes, it has been con controversial. Yeah. And is that because I feel like, you know, you talk about HPV, I mean, you're essentially talking about sexually transmitted it is in a sense. Uh -huh. and, and, and is that, I'm assuming that's the reason why people are, you know, not wanting to get their kids vaccinated that young. Right. It's, it's sort of like, you know, they're, they're too young to, for us to even be thinking about that. But what would you say to those parents? Well, I think it, um, as a gynecologist, as a GYN oncologist, my focus is on health. Um, and we know that sexually transmitted infections, if we talk about them more, if we normalize them more as part of just, you know, your well woman, your annual, your routine screening test as a way to keep ourselves healthy. Um, I think it's really important to destigmatize it. And just because you're getting vaccinated 
um, for a, a viral infection that is sexually transmitted, it does not mean that then it gives, you know, your child free reign to engage in promiscuous activity. That's not, you know, that doesn't actually even come into the conversation. The conversation, the focus is really about keeping yourself as healthy as possible. Gotcha. Um, we are getting some people tuning in. Thank you all for jumping on Facebook. Hi, Ivy, Anna, Denise. We're so sorry. She said my aunt passed away from that. Uh, Lauren Ridian, does the vaccine bring out an autoimmune disease like type one? Um, no, not the, not that we, not has, no, it hasn't been borne out in the literature at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, moderate dysplasia is the beginning stage of cervical cancer. Someone wrote in, is that true? So the thing about um, HPV changes, and I'm glad somebody asked about this, is that um, the way that it, it leads, you know, the process to cervical cancer does take some time. And it generally goes through a, a process of developing abnormalities called dysplasia. Um, that are essentially um, precancers. Um, and this is why still, even after getting the vaccine, um, and if, you know, especially if you haven't been vaccinated to see your gynecologist, to your general practitioner, to get pap smears and HPV testing, because what you want to do is to catch these changes before they actually turn and transition and transform into cancer. Um, and so it's definitely very treatable at these precancerous stages. Um, and this is, um, you know, something that can only be caught by a visit to your doctor. Right. Uh, we had a question that was written in ahead of time. So does a newly positive HPV test mean that my partner uh, has had other partners while I am with them? So that's a very good question. It's a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and the answer is not necessarily. Um, because the way um, HPV infection kind of the works, if you will, is depending on how um, well your immune system is working, you can clear the virus. It can also get reactivated. And so it could be from an exposure years prior um, that could cause a newly positive HPV test. Um, and so again, the important thing is for the person's health at the time is to get evaluated for that abnormality, um, to get treatment if you need it, and then, um, and then to also, again, get vaccinated. You can get vaccinated after even uh, testing positive for HPV. And if you were to get vaccinated after testing positive for HIV, or talk HPV. about what that would help with. So um, the, again, like I talked about before with the different types of HPV, mm -hmm. um, you may be HPV positive for a certain type, but then getting the HPV vaccine, which covers nine different types, can help protect you. Um, against the ones that you have not been exposed to. And um, just a few years ago, the FDA did approve the HPV vaccine up to age 45 for both men and women. So I encourage all of my patients um, under the age of 45 to, to, get that, um, to get the vaccine if they have not already. No, I feel like we're talking, we're in this world where we're talking a ton about Vaccine, yes. <laughs> right. We're hearing a lot about uh, the COVID vaccine right now, and everyone's interested in side effects, side effects, side effects. Any side effects that goes along with this HPV vaccine? Yeah, there's yeah, definitely the most common are going to be your local side effects of um, soreness and redness around the injection site. Those are the overwhelming majority um, of the side effects that you're going to see. Um, and I, I'm really actually glad that we are talking about vaccines because. Um, I think it's really heightened, heightened the, the awareness the public has about vaccines and the availability of all of these other vaccines um, that we have um, uh, to prevent disease. Um, I had a question come in. Is it safe for boys as well? Mm. Oh, yes, absolutely. So again, the same ages, um, you know, are approved for boys and girls. 
Um, so you could start getting it at age nine for both boys and girls. Um, the recommended age by the CDC is ages 11 to 12. Um, and then again, it is approved through age 45 for both men and women. And I don't know if I missed this, but I believe uh, at least some years ago, it was a series of shots, correct? Mm -hmm. Is it is yeah. it one vaccine? Is it a series still? It is still a series. It's a series of three shots. Of three shots. Separate, how yep. far are they spaced apart? Generally about a couple months. A couple months. Yeah. Okay, for those of us, or for those of you who are joining us right now, we are talking cervical cancer. We're talking a lot about HPV and vaccinations. Uh, doctor, would you just go over some um, early signs of cervical cancer for those just joining us? Yeah, so um, early signs um, would be um, bleeding, abnormal bleeding. So bleeding between your periods, bleeding after vaginal intercourse. Um, abnormal um, or foul smelling vaginal discharge. Um, those are kind of the most, the early, the common early signs. Um, of course, pelvic pain um, is another thing that we see um, sometimes in later stages of presentation. And of course, you know, changes to urinary habits or bowel movement habits are also more later stage um, the symptoms of presentation. Um, I do want to stress that um, the goal of screening is really to catch it before it is symptomatic, um, before patients will actually feel it because oftentimes, most of the time, to be honest, um, when patients are already experiencing the symptoms that I talked about, um, the tumor, there's already a tumor there. Um, and so when we have a tumor there, then it becomes, it's more advanced um, and it becomes more difficult to treat. And the goal, because we have such good screening methods with the PAP test, with HPV testing, the goal is really to catch it um, before it gets to that point where patients are seeing symptoms. Um, and we have reliable ways and, and really no one in this country should be dying from cervical cancer. You know, of course, I mean, who loves to go to, you know, the, the gynecologist, doctor, right? the gynecologist. <laughs> it's right. It's not always the most pleasant doctor to go to, but, um, is, is it, should it be yearly for all women? So the, the, um, it's so, I want to um, distinguish kind of pap tests and a visit to your gynecologist because they're not the same thing. Um, so the recommendation for cervical cancer screening, so pap and HPV testing is really to start at age 21. Um, but I do encourage all women, um, you know, and mothers to daughters, um, if they are, you know, getting to an age where, um, you know, patients um, are talking about birth control or contemplating sexual activity to really make that appointment um, very early on so that, you know, young women can get the education that they need about their own bodies, because that is one of the most pure ways of empowerment that we could give to young women um, is really to know what the anatomy is, to know what the normal, um, you know, biologic and physiologic processes of what is actually your period? You know, why is sexual activity, what can it put you at risk um, to in terms of infections and how do you protect yourself um, in, in terms of um, from uh, unplanned pregnancy as well as infection? Um, and so I, so I wanna stress that those, those annual visits you know, the are really about talking about, well, this is going on with my body or what is normal or, you know, and, and understanding from a reliable physician, um, you know, what's normal for your body and kind of using that as a way to, uh, of self-care truly. Yeah. It's so important for young women too, to know that, you know, going to you guys, I mean, it's a, it's a safe place and there's nothing right. you haven't seen and, and, um, you know, it can be a vulnerable feeling going in there, but it, it right. really, as you said, I mean, it's just so important um, to just have our young girls being educated early right. on. 
Um, so going back to, to HPV, let's say you get a, a, a positive HPV test. You mm -hmm. have it. Is there any chance of, can you ever get rid of it fully or will it always be in your body? So that's um, the answer to that question is dependent on a lot of different things. So it depends on the type of HPV that you're exposed to. Certain ones are um, tend to be more aggressive and more tenacious and hard-headed about not getting cleared by the body. It depends on um, you know what's going on uh, with the patient's other medical problems, if they have any, if they have chronic conditions that, um, you know, predispose them to um, depression in their immune system. So, um, so on the one hand, yes, it is very possible to clear HPV vaccine, uh, I'm sorry, HPV infection, especially in young patients. Um, but then if there's, you know, chronic steroid use for, you know, some sort of, you know, medical condition, if there's, um, you know, medications that need to be taken for um, immune modulators for patients who have like Crohn's disease or, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, um, or patients with HIV infection who, or who have organ transplant, um, those are the types of patients that have a different kind of screening schedule um, because they um, are less likely to clear infection. Okay. Yeah. So the, again, I go back to, I know I sound like a broken record. I go back to, you know, see your, see your gynecologist every year, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll get an update on your medical problems and then assess risk there because every patient is, is different and we have to see them as individuals. Yeah, no, certainly it's hard to see into the crystal ball into the future, but right. I mean, professors and, and doctors, you know, the vaccine is overall still newer. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Um, do you think that in the future, there's a way to sort of eradicate HPV with this vaccine years and years down the road? I, I mean, I think if we were to, to look at, you know, the historical evidence with polio, for example, yes. Uh -huh. um, I think um, the difference um, is that there are so many different types of HPV. Right. Um, and so I do wonder that if we, you know, get rid of the ones that are in the vaccine, you know, will the other ones that are currently less common become more common? Um, but at the same time, I think about the, the passage of time, the medical technology, will we then just add different subtypes to the vaccines that we administer? Right. Um, and so I think, um, I think there's definitely hope to, um, to greatly reduce um, the incidence of cervical cancer, you know, in this country, around the world. Um, but, uh, but health, like everything else is something we have to continue to be vigilant about. Right. And I know certainly we're focusing on cervical cancer, uh, in this Facebook live, but there are, um, there are long-term and, and really, uh, negative effects on males too, who get HPV years down the road. I mean, I can't. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, it's actually very interesting. A few years ago, I was at a, um, at my dental screening. Um, and we're seeing a lot more um, HPV related um, cancers, not just of the cervix, but also of the oral pharyngeal um, or the, of the tongue and the mouth and things like that. And so they actually, they were, my dentist was pushing HPV vaccine from that perspective. Um, and it's also plays a role in, you know, anal cancers, um, again, like I mentioned for other gynecologic sites, you know, vaginal cancers and vulvar cancers as well. And so, you know, the cervix, yes, only women have cervixes, um, and, but these other sites um, definitely uh, impact, um, you know, our, our male counterparts as well. Right. So it's interesting that HPV can really lead to cancer for males, females, yeah. And as we talked about, you know, you sort of compare it in the polio vaccine, but it's like, there's these vaccines that we just automatically, we don't really think a lot of, we're getting our kids early on right. when they're little and, you know, we don't put too much thought into them. At least I, right. you know, and I'm like, sure, vac you know, vaccinate them for all the stuff that you typically do. And, and right. this one is a little later and you, you have the option, you can, you don't have to, you know, and so right. it's, it's interesting. Right. Right. Now I think it, 
it has introduced a lot of conversation around it because it is like we talked about earlier, it's, you know, controversial because it's a sexually transmitted infection. Um, but I think again, um, hopefully we will, you know, we will evolve the conversation um, of health to really include some of these things that are a little bit more uncomfortable to talk about, um, but it doesn't make them any less important. And I would argue that it actually makes it more important to talk about because people are, are a little bit more uncomfortable. And so to go over that hump, like you just, you just have to move forward and it's, it's a medical issue. Right. All right, exactly. Um, Doctor, for cervical cancer, which age does it do you see it the most in? Yeah, so it generally um, affects uh, younger women um, in their forties. Uh, um, is the most common decade that we see at 40s to 50s. Um, and so when we're treating these patients, oftentimes they have young children. And that's why the, um, it is impressed upon us even more um, that the cancer diagnosis doesn't just affect the patient. It affects their young family tremendously. Um, and so again, um, this, uh, this is, this is the population where we see it the most. And what type of treatments are out there and available? Yeah. So if the, if we catch it early on where the tumor size is still, you know, on the smaller size um, side, then um, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Um, however, if it's discovered and diagnosed at more advanced stages, then treatment is uh, generally focused on chemotherapy and radiation our treatments. Well, there's been a lot to talk about. And I know that GBMC is great with any questions that have come in later and, and asking you those questions and getting a response, but it's been great information. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about, or maybe something you just want to emphasize to people out there who are listening to this conversation, whether it be about cervical cancer or HPV or the vaccine? Um, I think really we, we've talked about a lot of things, but I just want to, folk, you know, just reiterate, um, you know, seeing your physician for young women, educating yourselves about your bodies um, is really one of, I think, the pillars of self-care, getting your vaccine, vaccinate, 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 especially in this era that we're in right now. Um, I can't stress that enough. And I, I just want to thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, doctor. We appreciate it. It's a great conversation. And as you said, it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had uh, more in family. So thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us on this February Facebook Live talking about cervical cancer, HPV, and the vaccine. Uh, if you know anyone who's interested in this topic, be sure to share this video with them. And we will see you back here next month for our Facebook Live with GBMC. Doctor, thank you again. Take care. Thank everybody. you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Yeah.